Hello everyone, this is Strawberry Shorty here with my review of The Evil Within 2. As some of you may know, this is a game that I've been eager to get to. It's actually the whole reason I started playing uh, The Evil Within in the first place. If you watched my review of the first game, then you know that the story behind that is that I saw a top 10 video featuring bosses that were having more fun than you and the guy in the thumbnail caught my eye, watched his segment, and found myself wanting to play this game. I did end up knowing a fair amount of spoilers going in, unfortunately. Just like last time, we'll talk about those later, and there will be a warning beforehand. Anyway, let's get on with the review. We once again play as Sebastian Castellanos. It's been three years since the Beacon incident, and it still haunts him, as does the fire that took his daughter's life and ultimately led to his wife, Myra, disappearing. We learned a bit about his past in the first game, including that Myra suspected Lily wasn't really dead, and that someone had faked her death to abduct her. Sebastian's no longer with the police, and it seems like he's gone back to drinking as a coping mechanism, something that was also mentioned in the first game. Julie Kidman suddenly appears and tells him that Lily is still alive, and that her death was faked so that Mobius could kidnap her and use her as the core for another stem system. Her recent disappearance within the system has caused it to start acting up, and the team they send in to locate her has gotten stuck inside. Since Sebastian survived a similar experience in the past, they think he's the perfect choice for fixing their mess. Though, I watched a bit of the uh, Everything Wrong with the Evil Within 2 video, and they pointed out that Kidman had also survived that same incident, so, you know, they could have just sent her. Like, I've got a lot of issues with the plot and logic of this game, but I'll probably save talking about that for the spoiler section of the video. Uh, one of the things I knew about this game, even when I was still playing the first one, was that the voice actors of the returning characters had changed. I honestly wasn't expecting it to bother me. I knew this was referring to pretty much Sebastian and Kidman, and their voices in the first game weren't really, like, super memorable to me. I think that was just because it never felt like they spoke too much. Uh, anyway, uh, after beating the first game, I played this short indie title called Distraint 2, and then jumped straight into The Evil Within, too. Uh, so, to my surprise, Sebastian's new voice really did kind of bother me, at least at the start of the game. His original voice was pretty gruff, and I felt like it suits his new appearance. But, like, the new voice doesn't. It just doesn't feel right, and the acting seems off at times. His I do feel his voice got better as the game went on, but I, I feel like it was really bad in the first few scenes, especially uh, the bar scene. So, we get into this new stem, which is supposed to be an idealistic town called Union, and unsurprisingly, everything has gone to hell. Union is quite literally falling apart, with most of its citizens either dead or monsters. Our map's a bit more open this time around, and while I heard that was something some people had a problem with, it never really bothered me. It's actually not as open as it initially seems, and given that the setting is supposed to be this huge town, I think being able to explore it was kind of necessary. Having said that, I do wish we'd gotten to see more. A problem I'm having with a lot of modern horror games is the lack of files and side quests that tell us about the people who lived in these places that are being destroyed. I tend to rewrite these reviews as I play, and right now I don't really feel like I get what life in Union was like or what the people living there experienced. Anyway, the basic elements of gameplay haven't really changed too much, but there is some new stuff. Burning enemies is no longer a mechanic, and enemies you kill will stay dead. They've also introduced crafting for more than just crossbow bolts. I originally saw this as a way to allow players to choose between taking enemies on directly or sneaking around, which uh, is something I didn't feel applied to the first game. But I've since watched a Let's Play of the original where they focused on upgrading weapons and barely re relied on stealth at all. So I guess you could always choose how you handled certain situations, even back then. Still, I do think that applies a bit more here, because one of my complaints about the first game was how they really pushed the stealth mechanic and then started forcing you into situations where you had no choice but to fight. Here, pretty much every enemy can be sneak killed, though some require a bit more effort than others. Upgrading weapons and abilities uh, also returns, but with some minor changes. There are workbenches throughout the game where you can use weapon parts you find to strengthen your weapons in various ways. This includes firepower, critical hit chance, ammo capacity, and in the, chance of the, cr in the case of the crossbow, uh, the effects of the various bolts for it. You can craft ammo and items from the field, too, but this takes more resources. The green gel system 
is utilized again here. And on top of stuff like increasing stamina on how much health using healing items restores, you can gain a variety of special abilities. Uh, one especially useful skill allows you to automatically use a bottle, which are now inventory items, to attack an enemy that grabs you, so you can avoid getting damaged. As a quick side note, axes remain pickups here, but unlike in the first game, they stay on your person even when you switch weapons, uh, but you can only have one at a time. Uh, some people may feel that these skills make the game too easy, and there are some that don't work quite right. Like, the main skill this applies to is one that is supposed to allow you to rush up to an enemy and sneak kill them, but the prompt rarely showed up for me, even though the skill cost a huge amount of gel. This is apparently because the camera needs to be centered on the enemy, which is very hard to do without turning on that annoying uh, dot thing that remains on your screen at all times, and I didn't really want to do that. Uh, the lockers are back, too, but there's a random element to them that I don't like. The quality of the items you get seems to be dependent on how many keys you've used. Stock for ammo and syringes is upgraded via pouches you find, which I found to be somewhat frustrating since I was often forced to leave things behind. Some items vanish, too, specifically items left behind as rewards for completing certain quests, and axes that enemies drop. Uh, though the controls are largely unchanged as well, I still found myself having a lot of problems. In the first game, you could choose which trigger buttons were for aiming and shooting, and which were for running and sneaking. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case here. I had used the uh, L and R2 buttons for running and sneaking, but you can't do that in this game. So it took me forever to get used to, especially since I'd only just beaten the first game, and I kept getting killed because I'd accidentally pressed the wrong button. Also, uh, for my first encounter with like a real enemy, you couldn't sneak kill them. They would always notice you somehow. Uh, this game has an icon on the top of the screen which tells you when an enemy can hear some sound you're making, when they're looking for you, and when they've spotted you. I found, found this was a helpful feature overall, but not for this first encounter. I actually thought that this was an addition to the game, but watching that Let's Play I mentioned above, they actually had it when they were playing the first one, so I guess it was an option I just didn't have on. Uh, unfortunately, the controller issues aren't just limited to button assignments. I, I should probably mention I played this for PS4. Uh, I noticed numerous issues with input delay consistent among three different controllers. The button you need to press to equip your communicator would just often simply not work. Um, and when you smash crates to reveal an item, you'd immediately get a prompt to pick it up, but that would never work right away. I've also experienced an issue where my gun wouldn't fire, which I'm thinking, again, might be the input delay at work. Just like with the first one, I find it kind of frustrating that there are serious issues like these that haven't been patched, even though the game itself has been out for years. One thing they do have, which I'm going to mention here because I don't know where else to put it, are cheats you can enable. I know one renders you basically invisible and another makes you super strong. Um, it doesn't seem to be any downsides to playing with these on if you want. They don't like disable any rewards or achievements as far as I know. Uh, continuing on with the subject of controls, there were two new mechanics I had issues with, mostly because I felt they controlled horribly. The first is the cover mechanic, which is supposed to instantly move you so that you're pressing against a wall or crouching close to a box. The game will often force you into this and it's kind of an annoyance. Normally, sneak, normal sneaking lets you move freely, while moving in cover forces you to stick to the surface you're pressed against, and I had a lot of issues both leaving cover and turning corners. Not only that, but because of this mechanic, a little white arrow often appears on screen to tell you when cover is available, and it always makes me do a double take, thinking I've missed something when it just suddenly pops up. The other mechanic involves pressing X while holding the joystick up to climb onto things. Too many times I'd be sneaking around a car or a box, trying to wait to kill an enemy I'd lured there, only to get noticed when my character suddenly decided to climb onto the thing I was sneaking around. Also, I wasn't quite sure if it was my imagination, but I can now say with certainty that the game keeps turning my flashlight off. Unlike in the first game, I've heard the enemies in this one aren't attracted to light. Not that the game ever bothered to tell me that. <laughs> and because I don't know where else to mention it, I briefly experienced a glitch where my shotgun turned invisible, and I also got stuck in a drawer in the first safe house and nearly had to start the whole segment over. Uh, I've noticed a lot of issues with the first room in that first safe house. Like, another time after I, I did the, the cutscene where you block the door, I turn around and there's a table blocking that drawer and I couldn't even get to it. And there's, there's an item in there, so I, I don't know what's going on with that, with that room. Um, I also encountered a glitch while replaying the game on Nightmare. I, there, there's these big exploding enemies, and I lured them to a building and climbed up onto the, the roof so I could take care of them from a distance. They died near the ladder, and two different times I got stuck trying to go down it. 
and like my character would just freeze upon reaching the bottom of the ladder and just would not move at all so I had to reload both times which sucked. Overall though this game was definitely more enjoyable and less frustrating than the original in spite of some setbacks. I've heard this was an issue for some people who enjoyed how difficult the first game was. I can understand their feelings here because based on my experience upping the difficulty doesn't really change much. As someone who relies mostly on stealth, killing a majority of the enemies was just as easy on Nightmare as it was on the normal difficulty. Disarming traps is no longer really a thing, done away with like many of the more frustrating elements of the original. There is always classic mode, however, which removes autosaves and the ability to upgrade yourself and your weapons, and only limits you to uh, seven normal saves. I, I gave this mood, mode a try, but just ran into some really cheap deaths where like a one of one of the normal lost zombie enemies just like instantly killed me even though I had full health and having to redo that opening with the fire and the running during the credits is really tiresome um, before going into s the more spoilery stuff I should probably talk a little bit more about the story one of my uh, complaints about the first game was how little it seemed to have to do with Sebastian STEM in that instance was supposed to be this amalgamation of the minds of everyone within it, and while we got some of that with Kidman in our DLC, Sebastian's past is relegated to journal entries we stumbled across. Given how both he and Ruvik lost loved ones to fire, it felt like a real missed opportunity. There was also an issue with how little we got to see of the characters. In this game, the NPCs get a bit more attention, though I do wish more of them were Union citizens to give us more insight into life there. Kidman also has way less to do here, despite how important she is. The story is more personal for Sebastian, but there were still moments where I wish they'd done more. They have this whole guilt thing going on with him, yet it feels off at times. What about the files Myra left Sebastian? Did he never actually do anything with them? And there are times when Lily's image is used to feed this guilt, though we should be aware that the Lily in front of him can't be the real one in these moments. This game is also filled with stuff I can only call nonsensical. Sebastian doesn't really address what will happen once he successfully saves Lily, because obviously Mobius isn't going to just let him leave with her. Then there's their plans for STEM, which don't really make sense, and this obsession the villains have with gaining control of it, despite knowing full well it's not real. There's a lot about Union and STEM in the core that isn't elaborated on either, and what little they do tell us feels contradictory. For example, psychopaths are dangerous in STEM, especially if they have the power of the core. This is shown in the first game via Ruvik. But Mobius plans to eventually have everyone in the world in STEM, which would obviously include numerous psychopaths. They also talk about not needing these expensive pod things once they perfect wireless stem, but then wouldn't everyone bodies in the real world just die? It's super confusing. They really need to work more on this plot making sense. Another thing I criticized about the first game was the pacing. I do think it's better here, but while the first half has great atmosphere going on, they unceremoniously change things up and it gets really cliche. I personally think this game is overall better and more enjoyable than the original. If you liked the first game's difficulty, this one probably won't provide as much of a challenge. On the other hand, if you were like me and hated the frustrating moments of the original, you might enjoy this one more. There's not a lot of replay value here, as beating the game on the normal difficulty unlocks pretty much everything. I think the only thing you get from beating uh, classic mode is infinite ammo, and you don't get anything from beating the hardest difficulty, which seems strange. You can keep playing for achievements, but you don't actually get anything for those. I have been replaying it. But that might be due to my obsession with that uh, one character I mentioned at the start of this review. There is a lot of stuff from the first game that never gets addressed, and the one thing they do touch upon is also largely left unexplained. It seems like we should get an evil within three, but there hasn't really been any big news on that front. So, with all of that out of the way, let's start talking about spoilers. I'm planning to once again do the chapter thing here, just to help me organize my thoughts. Uh, so, chapter one might just take the record for shortest chapter in an evil within game consisting almost entirely of cutscenes. The opening gameplay segment has us controlling young Sebastian, who even in the first game just looks so weird to me. Anyway, we run through his burning house trying to save Lily, and though this is more like what I wanted to see in the first game, it's a bit too straightforward. I'd prefer like a real trippy Silent Hill experience, but to be fair, this is just a dream. He's not actually in STEM yet. Even though I went into this knowing a lot of the overall plot, I found myself getting really annoyed with Kidman, who was acting like a jerk during the bar segment. Uh, Sebastian gets taken to Mobius, and I mentioned this earlier, but it's really weird he doesn't even bring up what will happen once he saves Lily. Also, they show the Administrator, who was always cloaked in shadows during the Kidman DLCs. His design isn't bad or anything, but there was no need to show him at this point. Why is he even showing himself at all? He talks a bit about their ideas for STEM, and again, it makes no sense. What's the point of a unified consciousness? 
How does that benefit them? When did Lily get hooked up to the system? What is her life like in there? Going by the trailer, I guess she's just sitting in a room or house all day. Does she even have contact with anyone? If her being a child is a must to be a good cu be a good core, then what will happen as she gets older? Even if her body doesn't age in STEM, her mind is bound to. I feel so bad for her and like so angry at Mobius for robbing this girl of her childhood and intending to keep her hooked up to a machine her whole life. Not to mention what they did to Sebastian and Myra in burning down their house and kidnapping her. So we enter STEM and get an intro I don't really like. Like. Like I said, there's just a bunch of, like, running around during the credits, and they could have had a really cool cutscene, but it was all just, like, falling and running and poorly done flashback stuff. Uh, Kidman gets in touch with us via radio and will just be a supporting role in this game, or so she tells us. She occasionally says something. That is basically her role up until the end. If they're going to have her play this part, they could have given her a lot more dialogue. Chapter 1 ends there with no real fanfare, not at all like the first game. Our home base has Save Cat, for some reason. Why is he even here? Wasn't he Kidman's thing? It just feels kind of like some weird fan service and not something that actually makes sense. I should mention that this is where you can change your outfits after having beaten the game once, but it's set up really poorly. The game has to make an auto-save and reload it, which is a bit much for a PS4 game, and it also prevents you from changing outfits on Classic Mode, where auto-saves are disabled. We leave our new safety room, and there are a lot of drapes here. There's the body of one of the Mobius guys, repeating his moment of death on loop, and I'm way happier about this than is healthy, because I know who did this, and it's who I'm here to see. A phone rings, and that certain someone laughs at me and hangs up, but I'm totally okay with that. He actually shows up way earlier than I expected, and even though I've already seen this scene, I'm psyched. This is, this is technically where I experienced my first death, but I reloaded, so it didn't count. I wanted to see this particular death scene, so I just ran right into him. Nothing to worry about. Anyway, who is Manuela Roberto? We find her nameplate, but no body. Is she supposed to maybe be the guardian or whatever? Like, the second time we enter her room, we hear that buzzsaw sound. And right before the guardian attacks us, we do see that woman. But, you know, I really wish we'd learned more about the victims here. I feel like there are some interesting stories waiting to be told. There would be, there could be some, like, uh, really clever foreshadowing for the ones that took place in Union the murders that took place in Union, and just more in general for whatever victims he had before STEM. More on that later, though. Uh, the photographer appears in front of us again, but disappears. Kind of wish he'd stick around for a bit. We find more dead people, but these ones are less interesting. They apparently keep changing positions, but I somehow didn't even notice that when I played. Uh, sexy photographer man takes our picture, and then we see a woman in red who is never touched upon again. And I, I'm still wondering if she's supposed to be Manuela or the Guardian that attacks us two seconds after we see her. The Guardian is a pretty unnerving enemy, but running from her was weird because we still have basically no stamina. A rat gets unceremoniously murdered, and then we're getting chased again, but thankfully our hot new photographer friend appears and gives us a knife to fight her off with. This knife will remain with us for the entire game, being used for smashing boxes and sneak kills, but never melee attacks, because those still suck. Then suddenly we're back in normal Union, in some trashed house. We conveniently find a gun, and Kidman suggests we ask the totally alive locals for help. Were they not monitoring what was happening here in any way? Files we find later indicate they were at least somewhat aware of the lost issue, but Kidman clearly expects things to mostly be fine. Did they do any test runs on this project of theirs? So we are formally introduced to the lost, which are this game's main enemy. They are not particularly noteworthy, and I swear that one official picture we keep seeing of them looks like someone with underwear on his head. Is it just me? Does anyone else see this? The first lost is uh, she's force feeding her son, and this scene is clearly just to creep players out. No other lost we encounter shows this level of human behavior, and though this boy is at least a teenager and not restrained, he's just sitting there, not fighting back or trying to run at all. And like we see the woman run into the house, so why is why was the boy still sitting there even then? Like he could have like hightailed it while she was out. And uh, Seb Sebastian's cop training totally fails him here. And so the boy ends up dying and does not even warn a comment if you try to check him later. And this is the loss that you have to shoot and cannot sneak kill, which annoys me. You're faced with a bunch more loss shortly after this, and you need to get to a, and you need to get to certain locations and whatnot. Like I guess you could take care of this pretty easily if you want to, but I chose to kill them all and died a lot because you know I want that gel. And that's when I got inside and got stuck on that drawer, making me terrified I'd have to restart. 
because it had been a while since we had a proper save point, and like, I can never really tell when this game is auto-saving, I'm just not paying attention to the corner of the screen. It, it was certainly a lot easier in the original when you get that giant checkpoint indicator. So we meet our first NPC inside this house, and while I don't be hate being able to pick different, like, talking points, they could easily use this to give us more info on how this version of STEM and all this core stuff works. Chapter 3 already, and I'm getting nervous. I am unfortunately all too aware that our photographer friend won't be in the game past a certain chapter, and it feels like we're speeding through them. This is one of the more open chapters, and there's a lot of stuff you can do outside of the main objective. I didn't hate this. An open world that's too big can feel overwhelming, so this was just right for me. I do wish we had some more side quest stuff that gave us story info, though. Anima's freaking creepy as heck, and I love how they use the controller mic for her. The other big story side quest involves these two jerky Mobius operatives. They were basically planning to abandon their co-workers and massacre a bunch of Union civilians. I'm not sure what happened to the one, but Ryan Turner got what he deserved. I can't help but find it fitting that the man who plotted to kill terrified civilians ended up getting murdered by one of said civilians, who just so happens to be our photographer friend again. Uh, doing this side quest also gets us sent into his space again, which is pretty great. I really wish we'd gotten more side quests of this nature, where we're following a, sp a specific storyline and learning what happened to the people trapped in Union. I'm not entirely sure what happened to Ryan's friend, though. Like, is he supposed to be the dead dude we find outside the safe house? Anyway, the main story quest involves following Lily's voice on our communicator, which leads us to the revelation that someone is chasing her all across Union. Now, I knew who this was from the start, but it takes Sebastian a while to realize that it is the photographer. He captures Lily during the game, which begs the question what the heck has been happening in STEM leading up to this. i have been under the impression before playing that Lily had been captured before the game's events. She vanished within STEM a week ago, so what's been going on during all that time? Surely she hasn't been playing tag with our friendly neighborhood photographer for that long. It's also pretty clear he's toying with her, but I don't think he's patient enough to draw it out for a week. They do vaguely hint at time and STEM passing a bit differently, but that's never made much sense either, and I swear there are files indicating even within STEM it's been a week or so. Anyway, we find ourselves chasing after the photographer once again, still never clearly seeing him. I killed every enemy I could find in this chapter, but then he goes and uses his magic eyeball monster thing to summon up a bunch of new ones. That's just free gel for me, though. I could do without the whiny, poisons one, whiny, whiny poison ones, however. It's kind of hard to snipe them, like I invested in getting my reticle to stop moving so much solely for dealing with that specific enemy type. Also hate those freaking dog monster things. Uh, not much to talk about with Chapter 4. Just like in the first game, we end up in an area filled with gas where we can't use weapons. I'm not sure why that applies to the crossbow, though. They also kept saying there would be like a maze, which I was dreading, in part because of that section in the first game. In the end, it was actually extremely straightforward and I got through it with no issue. So this chapter ended up being a pretty short, and that again makes me sad because we are seeing so little of my favorite photographer. We have to deal with the Guardian again at the start of Chapter 5, and I'm annoyed that Sebastian just stands there watching her form after getting trapped in the area. Like, let's hide before she's able to see us standing there. I'm not sure how I ended up looking at a guide, but I was and decided to avoid fighting. Uh, City Hall is sadly lacking in victims, though there's still some nice art. We found one newspaper article about someone likely killed by our photographer friend, but that's it. I was kind of expecting us to learn more about victims like these and unravel their stories, but that didn't happen. Did you truly kill Emily? Why her specifically? I'm curious, but we get nothing else. We do get to finally meet the photographer directly, and he introduces himself as Stefano. I love him, but that should be obvious by this point. He looks good, has a great voice, and is just fun to watch and listen to. Unfortunately, he leaves all too quickly, and we're left to battle one of his creations, a camera lady named Obscura, who looks like something straight out of Silent Hill. She makes some concerning, snail-like noises, but isn't a particularly hard boss. I defeat her, and just like that, the fun's over and the building goes back to normal. We talk with Kidman, who totally cares about Lily. Like, I get that she couldn't exactly go against Mobius, but it still frustrates me when people act like they care about the kid, but then put her into STEM and took away her life and freedom. It's also really weird when she stands up and says all this stuff, because the administrator can totally hear her, and I wonder what he's whispering to that guy beside him. Chapter 6 sees some Stefano info put into your office. I love that picture of him that we get, but I'm still left wanting more info. You have to wonder why these idiots let him into STEM when even one psychopath could, could cause all sorts of problems. And then there's that bad review he got, which ticks me off. He's clearly got talent and deeply cares for art, so it's awful that someone said all that terrible stuff about him. I do wish we'd gotten to see this exhibit of his, and would love to know if he'd already started killing by this point. 
Also, I'm realizing Stefano was apparently in a cult, and what was missing in his life that he got involved in that? Who was he supposed to be in STEM? When and how did he get his memories back? I have so many questions that will never be answered. Anyway, this was thankfully a longer chapter, but only because I put off going to the theater while I explored the area. I died to that white goop snake a bunch of times. He'd always see me when I tried to sneak past him, but the real issue was when he grabs you and you have to shoot him. I can never see the reticle in those situations. We meet Hoffman, and like Kidman, she kind of angers me. She also let this happen to Lily, as well as all these other people. I get to the business district, and really wish they'd put some NPCs here. I enjoyed exploring, but th there just wasn't enough interesting content. Uh, chapter 3 at least had some neat side quests. We can encounter Anima again, but I didn't enjoy the mirrors thing. I'm no good at figuring out which door I'm actually looking at. There are also multiple guardians running around this area, and you have to be careful not to get seen by them. After I've cleared the area of all items and non-buzzsaw-wielding enemies, I head to the theater. We're already at Chapter 7, and I'm even more upset we're not seeing more of Stefano because I know he dies in Chapter 8. To make matters worse, this chapter is really short for me because it will begin whenever you approach the theater. Since I did all my exploring last chapter, all I have to do is the stuff with the paintings. I wish there had been more to them as well. Not just more Stefano, but more about the girls they seem to revolve around. They share the last name, the same last name, and they also share a ballerina motif and seem to be connected to Obscura. I want to know who these two are and wish there'd been more story and foreshadowing tied to them, like, I don't know, reports about them missing or if they really were ballerinas, like flyers for some performance of theirs. If these girls were used to make Obscura, they would have gone missing before the story, and you think Mobius would be like, hey, people are missing in Union, but that shouldn't be happening, what's up? So Chapter 8 arrives far too soon, and I'd really hope the game would have more Stefano. I knew he died partway through, but was still expecting he'd be more involved and that we'd spend most of that time in his areas. That was sadly not the case. He's interesting, and his areas have great atmosphere, and despite all the bad stuff he's done, I do feel for the guy. He's at least partially a victim, too, having been put into STEM and had his memory altered. I wonder if he was as confused as that, fe that one female NPC we meet was when he started to regain his memories. But the game never tells us, unfortunately. To make matters worse, this chapter doesn't have a lot to it. They could have warped the theater into another one of his little museums, but they don't. We get a slightly trippy sequence where we try to reach where he is, but then it's time for his boss fight. I do enjoy seeing him in action, but it feels all wrong. It's not just losing this interesting character so soon, with so much more they could have done with him, but it feels unfitting. Like, he's powerful, especially with Lily's influence. We should stand a chance against him, especially when you throw the giant eye into the equation. He could easily just stand back and let the eye kill us. I know it's not uncommon for games to make the bosses stronger in cutscenes, but I feel like they could have made us do something to weaken him, like maybe get Lily away from him first or something. We defeat him, and I thought he was going to take a picture of himself, but he apparently tries to take one of Sebastian to, I don't know, freeze him? Wouldn't that wear off when he died, though? He gives too much warning, however, instead of just doing it silently, so Sebastian is able to shoot him. And look, it's clear STEM has no clear rules, and the writers are just doing whatever they want. Dying in STEM doesn't have to mean you die in the real world. I haven't seen a real world body, so Stefano is probably fine. Chapter 9 is where the game takes a tonal shift, which I knew was coming. I already knew who the new villain was, but his area is just weird. Like, it's all fire and brimstone, and there's an annoying wheel puzzle, and there's so much violence and torture. It's not only cliché, but it seems a bit much. Like, was all this really necessary? This new villain, Father Theodore, is a cult leader with visions of godhood who is responsible of manipulating, for manipulating a lot of people into STEM. Said powers of manipulation are supposed to be his main weapon, but he's seemingly just been torturing, murdering innocent civilians for some reason. He's so obviously evil and doesn't hide it anywhere near well enough for Sebastian to want to trust him. He also keeps talking about how quickly Sebastian turns to violence, but I feel this would have worked better if that tendency had just gotten someone killed or hurt or something. I spoke earlier about how I wish we'd gotten more Union NPCs, and I think it might have been more interesting if they'd had Theodore be one such NPC, introduce him as just some generic priest guy who's a little culty, have him earn our trust and give some side quests, you know, actually show off his ability to make people like and trust him. We learn about as much about this guy as Stefano, but he has no charisma in comparison, and his areas were a lot less interesting. Also, he calls Stefano a thorn in his side, and it's like, shut up. My baby is an artist. Anyway, now it's time for Chapter 10, and we're holding down the fort with some lady, and I hate this part. It was really bad on Nightmare, and I think that was when I finally had to do some field crafting. 
Esmeralda is a better example of a strong female character than a lot of modern games have. She can handle herself, but isn't nasty to Sebastian for no reason. Having her as a tag-along NPC ruined my attempt at handling the area stealthily, however, as she started shooting the minute it seemed like we'd been spotted. Also, I missed the freeze bolt in this area, which I was super mad about. We learned there was some plan with her, Myra, Kidman, and apparently Theodore to free Lily and take down Mobius. Kind of makes you wonder why Mobius even hired Myra to begin with, given that they'd faked her daughter's death and abducted her and we're going to hook her up to the machine for the rest of her life. Chapter 11 sees us chasing after Hoffman. Or it would, but I'm heading back to the business district to see what's up there. There are flamethrower guys here, and following advice from a guide, I upgrade my otherwise unused smoke bolts to deal with them. I clear the area and help Sykes, who I'm sure made it out, just like Stefano did. I couldn't pick up all the rewards he left, and when I came back, the one item I left was gone, just like the first game. I did the last part of the Anima side quest, but I hated that we killed the part of ourselves that was left in STEM. Could Sebastian have just hugged him and merged with him or something? We also got the revolver, but I'm not sure how powerful it's supposed to be, so I didn't really use it much. We end up fighting a transformed Liam, who has some good dialogue. Well, it sounds cool at any rate. This battle was so hard the first time I played through. I think it's because I, on a whim, went after the achievement for destroying his fuel tank. He attacks a lot faster when you do that. A nightmare I didn't do this, but was but had basically no ammo by the time I was done. Like, I was whipping out all the different versions of weapons that I had just so I could use what ammo they came with, and I still just barely made it. I think I was on, like, my last, like, handgun shot or something. Chapter 12 has Theodore trying to guilt trip us, but it falls flat to me. It's clear Sebastian feels a lot of guilt, but at the same time, you know this guy doesn't have Lily. He literally keeps asking you to help him get Lily, so why does Sebastian fall for that fake of her that Theodore conjures up? The main area in this chapter is a dark abyss with invisible boundaries, so it's hard to explore. We end up in our house where Sebastian talks with some version of Mira that may or may not be real. She absolves him of his guilt, even though he apparently never took the note she left with him seriously, and that is never addressed. In Chapter 13, we learn that Torres apparently died saving us. And Sebastian really should feel guilty about this one, because why did he try and shoot Theodore, who I swear had already disappeared? Also, Hoffman claims that wound was uh, superficial, but how on earth could it be? I, I feel this uh, whole thing probably should have happened much earlier, like maybe before Theodore's speech about how Sebastian always resorts to violent first. Anyway, we learn that Torres set the fire that burned down Sebastian's house and is also responsible for kidnapping Lily. She had no choice at that point, so I guess she's not guiltless either. And she was trying, but I guess she's not guiltless either, and she was trying to make it right, ultimately sacrificing her life to do so. This does make me think of the babysitter who apparently also died in the fire. What's the story there? Did she really die? Why did Esmeralda let that happen? Anyway, since I cleared the business district earlier, things progressed fairly quickly. I have to protect Hoffman as we head to Theodore's stronghold through a wall of flames. Said flames make it very hard to see the fire monsters before they attack, so this part was a real pain. We do get some free ammo, though. Hoffman dies, and I'm not sure why Sebastian didn't try to shoot the monster that was on top of her. Now we're all alone in our quest to stop Theodore. Chapter 14, and I got another assault rifle pouch here, and I have never even used that gun. Those sniper pouches feel way more useless, though. I don't think I ever found any bullets for that gun outside of the lockers. While we were playing on Nightmare, I died a bunch of times in that area where you get trapped with the fire enemies, namely because they added a flamethrower guy in there. It takes way more trust to sneak kill them to death on Nightmare. And I stupidly hadn't properly saved before this point, because I was kind of hoping to find the goddess statue in this area before I got locked in there. So I was low on my smoke bolts. And then you have to try and do that without the other enemies see seeing you and getting involved. Uh, I hate the first part where you have to shoot the lever to turn off the flames. Like, for starters, if you try to shoot it before the gate closes behind you, it won't work and you'll have wasted your bullets. I think that's stupid. Also, Nightmare adds another flamethrower guy here. I uh, was surprised to find a residual memory of Theodore talking to Stefano in this chapter. I still have a lot of questions regarding why Theodore approached him specifically to grab Lily, but this does shed some light on how Stef Stefano wound up in a cult. I know he did some bad things, but this made me feel so bad for him, just the fact that Theodore was able to manipulate him just by telling him that he was special. It's just, like, really sad. So, Theodore needs to die for that. And also, you know, the whole threatening our wife and daughter thing. Seriously, this guy was supposed to be good at getting people to do what he wanted. But the game won't let us take him on directly. It said he makes us fight bosses from the first game. I thought the battle against the chainsaw guy was a little underwhelming, and Laura was as maddening as ever. 
She still has that insta-killability and her teleporting, and you have to fight her by turning these wheels, but she kept killing me before I was done. It overall didn't feel as epic as Theodore made it seem once we were done, and weird that her mind wouldn't summon up Ruvik himself as a boss. Myra actually gets the kill, too. We're in Chapter 15 now, and we're chasing after Myra this time. This sends us through some familiar areas, which are much more ruined, but there's not much noteworthy about them. Probably a weird time to mention it, but I miss the model viewer. It told us a lot of interesting stuff about the monsters and characters, and I kind of want to know why Mira is all about that weird white stuff. Anyway, Chapter 16 is a lot of running through nothing and cursing the fact that you didn't upgrade your stamina. We get residual memories showing Theodore betraying Myra, and why did they let him in on their plan to start with? How did he learn of their plan? No one tells us. Myra turns into a monster and we have to fight her. I died so many times on normal difficulty because I tried to fight her up close. I'm not great at hitting specific points on enemies, but at least none are entirely on her back like a certain boss in the Resident Evil 2 remake. I hated that fight. Chapter 17 is the last chapter. Sebastian is about to save Lily and Mobius is preparing to kill him. Not sure what they plan to do if this happens again. Kidman refuses to go along with this, so they try to kill her. We have to play as her for this annoying shootout sequence, and she has none of my upgrades to reduce reticle sway. This whole plan is beginning to get increasingly stupid, because given the size of Mobius, she should totally have died before ever leaving this room. There's some really cool scene changes here, and it's a little sad when Myra stays behind to sacrifice herself so Sebastian and Lily can escape. Apparently everyone employed by Mobius has these chips in their head that are connected to STEM. Why they would do that, and also hook these up to their experimental technology that was having problems way before this point, is beyond me. It is way too convenient, but I can see why they did it, in terms of the writers, why the writers did it. Because they made Mobius too big and too powerful, with members in political office and law enforcement. Something like this was the only way they could actually take such a big threat down completely. There's a scene of us rushing back to our room with the, meaner sh with the mirror shining in the distance to tell us the way. It's pretty awesome, but I think they could have put off the mirror a bit, a little to make it cooler. We return to the real world, and Sebastian gets a happy ending. There's a stinger with STEM reactivating in the ruined Mobius facility, but who knows if we'll ever get any follow-up on that, Joseph, or Ruvik in Leslie's body. We also have no knowledge of the fates of Sykes or that civilian we saved. I overall enjoyed the game, but there are so many ridiculous plot issues, just like in the first games. I've addressed a lot of them already, so let's talk about the villain's motives. Mobius' intentions for STEM make no sense to me. Let's forget about them for now, though. I can see why STEM appealed to Stefano, because it let him do all sorts of creative things. At the same time, it could all be erased in an instant if Mobius chose to do so. He also was quickly running out of both victims and people to appreciate his art, and would never be able to achieve the worldwide fame he dreamed of. Theodore, meanwhile, seemed to be intending to use those chips implanted in the Mobius members to control them, taking advantage of their members being stationed everywhere to bring about his paradise. Whatever that was supposed to be. This also seems a bit silly, because would that even work? Those chips allow mind control? I have a real problem with these, these days with horror games not thinking their plots through. Like, they want something to happen, but don't bother to think about it making sense. This is something I still hope to do a video on in the future, probably in relation to the recent Resident Evil titles, which I feel do this a lot. Um, I was thinking that, on top of introducing Theodore earlier, they could have had him take over as a villain without killing Stefano. Since it doesn't make sense that we're even able to beat Stefano, have Theodore interrupt the fight and grab Lily, attacking them both in the process. Stefano doesn't have to, like, become our ally or anything, but I could definitely see him turning against Theodore, who was clearly manipulating him from the start. And, you know, since we find that, uh, that card of his, the invitation from the cult with the, the lies comment on the back, he was probably at least somewhat aware of that. And then after Theodore grabs Lily off-camera, Myra actually manages to steal Lily from Theodore, but Sebastian doesn't know that, so he pursues Theodore. This would also make more sense for those moments when Theodore tries to use Lily to guilt trip Sebastian, because Sebastian wouldn't know that he doesn't actually have her. Anyway, that's about it for this video. I really hope we get an evil within three, and that Stefano is somehow in it. I doubt that will happen, though. At least, the latter part. This game doesn't have much to offer in terms of replayability, but I like that character enough to want to replay it. Uh, classic mode is proving annoying, though, with the limited saves, and if you die in Chapter 3, having to redo all that stuff in the beginning over again is really tedious. Uh, it's also kind of a bummer that we never got any DLC for this game. Like, I'd play a dark Pokémon Snap with Stefano taking pictures of bodies around Union. Or, like some people said, like something with Sykes escaping STEM. 
Anyway, I got a lot of great comments on my video for the first game, and I'm really hoping that will happen again. I want to hear what you guys think of the game, too, and if you agree or disagree with my opinions. So please comment and subscribe, and thanks so much for watching. See you all next time!